truth about the infamous David Sarnoff story. <laughs> Sarnoff uh, was an employee, as you know, of the American Marconi Company. And, uh, oh, i got to tell you another story. You'll love this. <laughs> oh, more, it's not on my list, but catch me while, while you can, because you will love this story. Um, uh, they were making nippers by Oaking Coal Company in Ohio, was making nippers uh, of various sizes. They started out in papier-mâché later on, I think in the 1940s after the war or in the 50s, they converted to uh, polyethylene. And by the way, the uh, and Oaking Coal event Company eventually went out of business. It's now owned by Trilogy Plastics, and I'm thrilled to tell you that Trilogy Plastic, all the molds for the, all the sizes of dogs were destroyed except one. Oh. And it's for the standard size 18-inch nipper, and I've got it. They gave it to me. And are we all going to get a copy? <laughs> Mold your own nippers. You can mold your own dogs. At any rate, I got to tell you about the dogs. Um, uh, the Berliner Company and the Victor Company were importing dogs from Camden, New Jersey. Uh, they were they were made uh, there, and uh, uh, one day they were in a hurry to get some, and the dogs were mainly to give to dealers. That was the purpose of the dogs. Uh, later on, they were sold to the public. Uh, Old King Cole was permitted to sell them to the public. And, uh, but originally, they were uh, made only for uh, Victor. So, the Canadian company would buy uh, dogs from, uh, nippers from the States. And one day, they realized they were out of nippers and they needed them very quickly. So what did they do? They resorted to Western Union <laughs> to send a telegram, telegram ordering a bunch of nippers. Well, the guy who placed the order over the Western Union, to the, called the Western Union Telegraph Office in Montreal, placed the uh, uh, order for a telegram to be sent to Camden, and he read it right off of uh, a sheet, and they copied it in the telegraph office to send it off, and he ordered a quantity of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Western Union guy who got the message to transmit said, uh-uh, these guys are sneaking dogs into the United <laughs> So he called the police. <laughs> and we were raided. <laughs> by the Montreal police. <laughs> and, uh, completely taken by surprise, but at any rate, they said, You're, uh, we're accusing you uh, of uh, uh, sneaking, importing dogs into Canada. And of course, uh, the Berliner gramophone people realized uh, what they were talking about and said, no, these are nippers, they're paper mache. And, and uh, oh, the policeman said, we know Nipper. Yeah. Why didn't you say so? <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, the police went away with their tail between their legs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now back to the script here. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Pop had taken uh, Victor's shares, and now we come to Titanic and David Sarno. And this is a story that will curl your hair.
Uh, stop me if you've heard it. As you know, he was supposedly working for the uh, American Marconi Company and being a radio groupie. He was a visionary and a bright man. Uh, came from Russia. He was 21 years old in 1912 when Titanic sank. Uh, he would was so gung-ho radio, and everything, of course, as you know, was Morse code, where you hit the, hit the code key uh, on the ship-to-shore radios, and uh, a spark would come out, and that's why uh, uh, wireless operators of the era were, no, were called, nicknamed sparks, and that was very commonplace. It solved the problem of having to remember the guy's names. <laughs> anyway, um, Sarnoff apparently was the only man on land. He had sneaked up to a receiving station on the roof of Wanamaker's department store in New York City where Marconi had a receiving station, not a transmitting station. The transmitters, I think, were out on Long Island. At any rate, they could receive with a rooftop antenna, antenna on top of Wanamaker's. And he would go in there late at night to listen to wireless transmissions from the ships talking to each other and also talking to uh, 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 shore uh, installations. At any rate, he, of course, hears the distress signals of Titanic. Uh, the distress signals, I think, started about 11 o'clock at night and ended when Titanic went under at about 2 a.m. on April the 15th, 1912. Sarnoff was there and he was supposedly the only man on land that heard ti that Titanic had sunk. Um, and it is now 2 a.m. Now I have been told by a fellow Montrealer that uh, there were some Canadian fishermen who heard the distress signals. I still say that it is undoubtedly true, but were they on land or were they on their boats? Because my claim is he was the only guy on land. All right? And it doesn't matter, but at any rate, for all intents and purposes, he was the only one. What did Sarnoff do? Well, everybody would have thought, my gosh, call the New York Times. <laughs> Call the Associated Press, or if they were in existence in those days. No, Davy was too smart for that. At 9 o'clock in the morning, he appeared at the doors of the Cunard White Star Line. I'm sorry, not Cunard, then White Star. White Star had been formed to compete with Cunard, which the British pronounce Cunard. Uh, right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at any rate, they knew, incidentally, that they could not compete on speed in crossing the Atlantic. So White Star opted for competing on luxury. These ships were luxurious beyond belief. Titanic was not the first ship. It had a sister ship, the Olympic. It had another ship that was launched uh, a, a couple of months after. The Olympic was already in sea trials and had completed them and was functioning as a um, passenger ship. Titanic was not the first ship. It was the second one. But nobody talks about the Olympic for obvious reasons. At any rate, Sarnoff hears Titanic distress signals, knocks on the door of the White Star Line New York office, and convinces the people there that their flagship had sunk. Well, what did they do? Being smart executives, they immediately sold their stock. <laughs> and then they announced the news. In the meantime,
meantime, Sarnoff had gone back to uh, Wanamaker's and busied himself continuing to take down the names of the survivors, which were being broadcast by the Carpathia, which was the ship that was nearest to Titanic, and they were picking up all the uh, survivors. And uh, so Sarnoff did uh, uh, take down as many names as possible, all on Morse code, uh, of course, which he was expert at. And uh, uh, then, fast forward, because we haven't the time, to 19, uh, 1919. World War I has come and gone. Uh, incidentally, Sarnoff applied for a commission in the U.S. Army in World War I. Uh, and he was in his early 20s. He applied for the commission, and the recruiting officer said to him, we will not grant you a commission because we already have a sufficient complement of Jews. Oh! <laughs> now you'll, you're going to hear the upshot of that, because there is a ramification in a strange way. But I'm here to tell you strange things. <laughs> so, this. At any rate, uh, after World War I, the U.S. government realized that uh, communications from ship to shore, military communications, were uh, 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 demanded. So they went to the two leading electrical equipment makers of the day, which was General Electric Company, founded by Thomas Edison. By the way, did you know Thomas Edison, the great bigot who hated immigrants, Jews, and blacks, was the son of Canadian parents? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> At any rate, uh, 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 these two giants of the electrical products uh, formed a joint <coughs> venture which they named Radio Corporation of America. And Sarnoff called upon, he called in the, the chips because those high-powered businessmen from White Star Line which had become Cunard White Star. Can you imagine? Uh, uh, White Star was designed to compete with Cunard, and Cunard ended up owning White Star. And it became known for years as Cunard White Star Line. Uh, and then White Star was dropped, and Cunard still exists, and it's owned by Carnival Cruises down in Miami. Uh, at any rate, uh, so, we now have a Radio Corporation of America, and it did business with Victor. It was started putting radios in, in combination units with gramophones. Uh, electrical recording came in, uh, and uh, the, the uh, gramophones were converted to uh, electric. By the way, uh, another uh, aside, which I think you're entitled to know, uh, Gianni Bettini did a crazy thing that nobody paid any attention to. He had done this in 1902. He figured out a way to use a Berliner telephone transmitter as a phono pickup. Remember the original Berliner microphone had a pin in a diaphragm? Well, how about using that to pick up grooves? So he did, and he developed a method of mass dubbing electrically. He had invented electrical recording in, in 1902, but it was not until two dozen later that Western Electric division of the Bell system invented electrical recording. 
Bettini never did anything with his invention. The patent is there. Alan Koenigsberg published it, and uh, but even Bettini never paid any attention to it. Neither did Bell or Berliner or Blake. And we could have had electric recording uh, two dozen years earlier. And uh, that's a shame. Anyway, uh, now RCA is in the business of making radios, and they've tied up with Victor and others to uh, produce radio phono combinations and so forth and so on. This went on for many years, and now we come 10 years later. We're now up to 1929, uh, 10 years after the formation of RCA. And what does the U.S. government do? It tells GE and Westinghouse, sorry folks, you are two competitors owning the same company. Can't have that. And they said, but you told us to. <laughs> and they said, we've changed our mind. <laughs> and GE and Westinghouse were forced to uh, uh, divest themselves of this radio corporation of America. The way they did it was they distributed shares on a proper uh, accounting basis to the present GE and Westinghouse shareholders. So those shareholders got ownership of Radio Corporation of America. They became the new stockholders and GE and Westinghouse were out. Um, now here comes RCA with a lot of money, but no factory and no distribution. And it's off on its own now. It's got to compete. Well, Sarnoff figured out that there was a sitting duck whom they had been doing business with for years anyway, namely the Victor Talking Machine Company. So they acquired Victor uh, in uh, 1929. Interestingly, Eldridge Johnson, the head of the Victor Company, had resigned in 1927, and his young son, uh, his only child, uh, Fenimore, uh, took over and became head of Victor Talking Machine Company. He never liked uh, the Radio Corporation of America, and neither did my father and plenty of other people. Uh, uh, mainly because of Sarnoff's very bad reputation. Sarnoff was brilliant and a visionary, but he was a nasty guy. Even driving a man to suicide, uh, uh, what's his name, the inventor? Armstrong. Major Armstrong, Armstrong, the inventor of FM. Uh, another interesting aspect of that was that he went to Armstrong's funeral and in conversations with the people who were attending, he said, you know, I'm not responsible for his death. Well, nobody asked him. <laughs> guilty conscience? Or yes, the guilty conscience. Of course, the guilty conscience. Uh, anyway, uh, we're getting near the end. Uh, uh, in 19, okay, so uh, RCA is uh, doing very well by itself. It acquires the Victor Talking Machine Company, which gave it the manufacturing, the distributing, and the world's most famous trademark, originated by Emil Berliner in 1900. And Nipper was reigned for 50 years <coughs> as the world's most famous trademark. Uh, at any rate, that was irresistible. So. RCA bought Victor for cash. Well, the Victor shareholders, this was a closed group of shareholders, it was not publicly traded, my father being one of them, uh, of course sold all their shares to RCA. My father, and I'll tell you what he sold it for, because I know you're just dying to hear that. <laughs> 
He got $1 million for his shares. That was in 1929. He considered that a very handsome sum. And... Uh, Is that before uh, the stock market crash? Yeah. I was about to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you anticipated my every move. <laughs> and by the way, RCA was one of the principal causes of the crash. Speculation, speculation in radio, as it was called, with the stock symbol RC, which Sarnoff changed years later to RCA, which I... Okay, if the Bell system, you know, had the greatest of all stock symbols, the T for telephone. Uh, at any rate, uh, that, that's neither here nor there. Uh, but part of the trivia you have to absorb in order to uh, have my company. <laughs> um, uh, no, uh, nobody wanted to work for Sarnoff. He had a very bad reputation. And my father resigned essentially on my birthday in 1929. Uh, and uh, Sarnoff asked him to stay on for a year to tide RCA over so they could learn uh, the record business and manufacturing and all of that, which they were not involved with under GE. At any rate, uh, to your point, the stock market crashed about that time. I think it was in October. I'm not sure. But at any rate, my poor father, he hadn't had time to invest the million bucks. <laughs> poor dad. They had a bad time. And so there he was stuck with a million dollars in cash and when a million dollars meant something. And uh, at any rate, he took part of that money, great man that he was, and lent money at very low rates of interest. He demanded interest uh, to Victor employees who were put out of work oh, wow. by RCA or by the Depression. <laughs> and many of them paid him back, many of them never did, and that was okay with him. That's fantastic. At any rate, that was a, that was wow. pretty good. Uh, he also bought a dairy in Montreal. They had a dairy called Laurel Dairy. It was foundering. It was in bad financial shape. My father was a great <coughs> businessman. He bought the dairy and uh, went and brought in some of the Victor people to help him run the dairy. These are guys who, who'd never seen a cow. <laughs> at any rate, they actually restored the dairy to uh, 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 financial uh, life. And their greatest customer, they, they sold to the housewives with door-to-door -door milkmen. But they had another customer that was my father's favorite customer because they bought the richest cream that Laurel Dairy produced. Who was this customer? Woolworth Stores oh, for their yeah. soda fountains. They thought that this rich cream would be an attraction to customers. So they bought richer cream than uh, especially for them, with uh, uh, cream content, especially uh, prepared for them uh, in order that they could uh, uh, attract customers. Uh, now, getting down to the end, some good stuff is yet to come. Uh, don't leave. You're leaving? Don't you dare. Okay. Getting back to Sarno for a moment and the anti-Semitism that he experienced, he experienced tremendous anti-Semitism at the Marconi Company. Uh, they would play tricks on him, his, his uh, cohorts there would play tricks on him. Uh, they made no bones about it that they didn't like him and wished he weren't there. 
and uh, I won't go into the tricks that it, it's all hearsay, it doesn't matter. At any rate, um, Sarnoff in 1926, radio has come in in the, in the early 20s, 2021. Uh, in fact, I believe a Canadian radio station was on the air before the famous Pittsburgh station that takes credit for it, KDKA, was on, I think, in Canada. They were broadcasting commercial radio. <laughs> Probably the only one who heard it was Herbert. <laughs> uh, and he was their number one artist. <laughs> anyway, uh, 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 the... the uh, the National Broadcasting Company was founded in 1926 to tie, uh, uh, to create a network of nationwide railway uh, radio stations, and Sarnoff decreed a very interesting thing. Because of the anti-Semitism that he had encountered, and because the ad agencies, the advertising agencies, all, all of which were on Madison Avenue in New York, were notoriously anti-Semitic. Uh, he decreed that no Jew could be in the management of NBC, and no Jew could be an announcer for NBC. It was his fear that these anti-Semites that he was relying on for as customers of the network would not want to do business with a Jewish company. He also had that philosophy at RCA. I think he was the only Jewish person in the RCA uh, hierarchy until he brought in his son, <laughs> and believe me, <laughs> That was no benefit to the company. <laughs> uh, one son, the oldest son, went to work at RCA and uh, actually took over when uh, David died. <coughs> the second son was made uh, a high executive, maybe not the head of NBC. That was Tom. Uh, anyway, um, that was an interesting uh, sidelight that uh, doesn't make the history books. Um, we're now down to the bitter end, and I have two things to do. One is, we're, the last of which will be the discussion of, uh, well, no, I think, yeah. That's what I get from going from notes. Normally I'm extemp and I got to have just like that. <laughs> I'm using notes because yeah, I'm scared of you guys. <laughs> thrown me off. Anyway, um, I have my thousand dollar challenge for you, and this is no joke. In 1914, one of the 24 copies made of the His Master's Voice trademark by Francis Barad himself, there were other artists who were commissioned, by the way, to uh, make copies of the uh, painting, uh, but <coughs> Barad himself made 24. One of those, uh, they were paid for by the Victor Company and by the Gramophone Company. Uh, one of them, of course, went to Eldridge Johnson, the head of the Victor Company, and it now resides in a the Johnson Museum in Delaware. Johnson was from Delaware, but he had his success, of course, in New Jersey. But at any rate, uh, uh, the Johnson uh, trademark portrait is uh, 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 available for all to see. But in 1914, Grandpa got one. Where is I have been hunting for it for 20 years. I thought my cousins, who stole most of Grandpa's memorabilia, they were Johnny on the spot, they were in Washington, I was in California, uh, 
I thought that they had it. It turns out they didn't. The question is, where is it? Because I want it. It will come home. It will come home. It's here. It will come home. He knows. It is here. And I am challenging you to anybody who's interested to try to locate that painting. And if you locate the painting, it doesn't matter whether I am able to glom onto it, but I just want to know where it is. I will pay you $1,000 for telling me, proving where it is. But it was sent to Montreal, and I believe it disappeared when Herbert got fired. I think he took it with him. That would have been a painting received in 1914. It was sent to Montreal, we know that. Herbert left in 21, and I think the painting left with it. Now, I have for you, and I'm turning it over to, uh, to Mark, uh, Herbert's full name, the name of his wife, which was Jessie Kerr Fleming. He married her in 1915. He had a daughter named Catherine, and she was born December 30, 1915. Yes. Uh, yes, he married uh, uh, Jessie Kerr uh, Fleming in February of 15, and by the end of December, they had given birth to their only child. Uh, he lived at uh, uh, Lansdowne Ridge in Westmount, which is the high rent district, as you know, of Montreal. It's the Beverly Hills of Montreal, as it were. Uh, and you're going to have all this information I just recited to you. If you want to follow it up at your leisure, I'd love to have you guys do it, anybody who wants to do it, uh, to do it, and then tell me about it. Uh, love to find that painting even if I can't get it. Uh, all right. Now we go, so we've done the thousand dollar challenge. Can I ask you, do you know the size of the painting at all? Uh, it is smaller than the original size, but I don't know the height, uh, the, the, the dimensions. However, we may have that. Uh, this is something that Ruth Edge, the historian for the gramophone uh, company in London, in now EMI, uh, prepared. And this presumably accounts for every painting, every copy made, and who the artist was. And I think it gives dimensions in certain instances. And uh, uh, of course, you know there's the, uh, the uh, Chinese copy. And that's at, uh, uh, at Capitol Records on the eighth floor in Hollywood. Uh, anyway, I'm leaving this with you guys. I don't think you have all this. This is pretty detailed stuff. I have my copy. This is your copy. And uh, <coughs> at any rate, uh, and I've left the information on uh, Uncle Herbert and his wife and daughter, what little I have. So uh, uh, have fun if you're interested. Mr. Berliner? Sir. There's a television show on PBS called Mystery Detectives or History Detectives. Oh, yes. They would love to do that for you. Well, I'll have to tell them about it. You need to check into that. Yeah. If anybody can track it down, they could. They okay. could. Yes, sir. Remark. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, after this lady, this lady's come. Get breakfast. Let's hold everything till I get rid of this topic and I can relax. What is the image? It's the His Master's Voice trademark. Okay. It ain't a shot of a meal or me. It is the trademark. Yeah. Painted by the the artist himself. Um, okay, we're getting down to the end, as I keep saying, and you're very patient with me, and uh, I'll try to make it uh, uh, worth your while. Uh, 
interesting thing before I get to the dinner end and we talk about what's the greatest invention. Don't forget that. I won't leave until you tell me. So you're stuck. It's up to you. At any rate, eight. The number eight is a magic number in audio for a couple of reasons. Reason number one is, if you take the number eight, the figure eight, and you turn it on its side to make what I call a lazy eight, it forms the symbol of infinity. The lazy eight pattern, by the way, is used on the original hand crank Berliner gramophones, a lazy eight, and there's one over there. <coughs> There it is. You'll see it's an eight turned on its side. All right. The magic eight is when turned on its side, it is a symbol for infinity <coughs> in the uh, engineering world and, and beyond. And it is said, think about this, although don't dwell on it. It's not worth it. Uh, that all sounds, including the sounds of my voice, or a tree crashing in the forest that nobody's supposed to be able to hear, uh, all sounds decay but never disappear. And at infinity, they will be gone. But although we don't hear them, the Billions and trillions of sounds made by everyone and everything are theoretically still with us. So that's one of the uh, amusing concepts of audio. But now, bring it to life. Get, get this, and it's a bit of a stretch, but at any rate, Listen to all of the names of the greats of audio that have eight letters. This is amazing. Here we go, with apologies to some guys because I really <laughs> contort some of them. How about Alex Bell? Eight letters, four for Alex, four for Bell. E. Johnson for Eldridge Johnson. V. Poulsen for Valdemar Poulsen. F. Barra for Francis. Harrison, eight letters, Henry C. Harrison. C. Tainter, Charles S. Tainter. Amar Bose, one of the three richest men in audio. If you'd like to guess who are the other two, we can do that. I'll tell you. Uh, G. Bettini, eight letters. J.T. Mullen, one of the greatest engineers in uh, mag magnetic recording. Ray Dolby, eight letters. Bloomline, eight letters. C for Charles G. McProud, the great editor of Audio Engineering Magazine that launched really an industry. This one you'll love. This is a stretch. Nick, N-I-K. Tesla. Uh, <laughs> I had to work on that, I'll tell you. Uh, Fletcher, for the great acoustician, Harvey Fletcher, getting down to the end here. Well, oh, G. Marconi, of course. And don't forget Berliner. Okay. And now we come near the end. You'll be thrilled at all. Yeah. Here's a Berliner disc, Berliner Gramophone Company disc from about 1890. <laughs> <laughs> you see where I'm going. A Deutsche Gramophone disc from about 1990. Now, get the amazing similarities. Both recorded on one side only. This one on the top 
this one on the bottom, and by the way, as I mentioned earlier, the Berliner patent says record on the bottom. It also says record inside start, and these CDs are on the bottom and inside start. They are, of course, both single face. There is no paper label. There is a center hole. They're the same size. And these are banged out on a press in the same method that these were. But there is one big difference, dear people. This 100-year-old disc is perfectly playable. When this becomes a hundred years old, forget it. Here endeth the epistle. <laughs> Before we adjourn to something better like uh, coffee and cakes, um, we, I insist that you tell me what you think is the most beneficial uh, uh, invention as far as for mankind. The wristwatch? Or clock. Or the clock. Okay. Uh, that's pretty good. Nobody ever said that. that that's pretty good. Uh, and remember, I am not the authority. I'm just going to give you my opinion. You over there, sir. I said a patent system. The what? A patent system. Oh, okay. By the way, if you're going to say uh, the salt vaccine, that's already been taken. <laughs> and it's not it, but it's close. Yes, sir. Movable type. Movable type. Hey. <clears throat> yes, sir. What? Electricity. Yeah. Oh, electricity? You are closer than anyone has ever come. <laughs> You, sir. <laughs> yes, sir? Electric light. No, you would think that. Uh, that is outclassed by the telephone, by the way, as, as far as its impact on the world. It's pretty well acknowledged the telephone had more benefits than the electric light because where there were other sources of light without the use of electricity. Um, okay. Oh, he's taking my picture. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? They developed electricity, but I, I think the uh, most beneficial thing is the development of transmission of electricity without the control of the world. You're all, you're right around it. You're, you're so almost there. Uh, you two guys are all, you've skirted around it. <laughs> it's, Alternating current. Yeah. Yeah. Without AC, nothing could happen. Nothing could happen. And that's the invention, by the way, of uh, Nikola Tesla, whom Edison hired to save his, the situation when it came to designing the power system for the city of New York. Edison hated alternating current, didn't know enough about it, hired Nikola Tesla to solve the problem, said you've got to solve the problem in 30 days. And Tesla did it. When he went to Edison for to get paid, Edison said, oh, it's just a challenge. I was never going to pay you. <laughs> Edison also stole the uh, uh, motion picture from the Englishman William Freeze Green. Uh, who made the mistake of thinking that his British patent for motion pictures would uh, serve in America. Unfortunately, that was not true. And uh, Edison went, patented the motion picture and took the credit for it. Mr. Edison didn't make the first light bulb either. Correct, sir. There was a couple in Toronto here that had it before he did, and he bought them out. I've got a news cut. I, did, I, I knew, I, I did not know that, but I did know that he did not create the first uh, uh, no, light bulb. Probably the people in Toronto created the first light bulb. Because I, I knew shows that like, music was a stage play, and they had a yep. pen light bulb there, you know, one of the reproduction ones? Yeah. And these, these people said, you're wrong. Well, said you said, you people to the, draw the paper. <laughs> How about and that? And thought they are right, that you got the credit for it. That is to be expected. You know Edison. He was uh, uh, 
personal publicity out. There's no doubt about that. Thank you, sir. Oh. If, um, if anybody has any questions, uh, uh, we'd like to sort of regulate them a little bit to, to just sort of flow, flow along and uh, keep us moving. But uh, if uh, we can take a couple of questions, if anybody has anything uh, particular. Oh, two hands go up. Paul <laughs> <laughs> was first, I think. All right. Mr. Berliner. You, you were Berliner, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, you stated that uh, your grandfather was possibly against uh, having a recording studio in Montreal. I'm wondering whether the truth of it really was that what he came to blows with Herbert over was the fact that Herbert was having the same artists like Billy Murray coming up from the States. He was recording them in Montreal doing the same material that was available, As was available in the States. Yes. And because I know that, that your father continued on with, with the Canadian series of recording yes. after he took over, yes. and, and it, it flourished under him. So oh, absolutely. Uh, all, my only comment on that is uh, your opening remark was somewhat mistaken. Uh, uh, Grandpa was not against it. He just, uh, and he, did, he did not want to stop recording in Canada because it had begun and they were doing it and he was not against that he just figured that there that the American artists were more popular and also cheaper since he didn't have to pay for it and so it, it was not that he was dead set against it or that he didn't have a studio remember they were laboratories <coughs> no he was using the same artists yeah, Victor was using it. Yeah, of course. Just duplicating it. Yes. And not, Herbert was not, not putting the Victor yeah. part on the label.